Today we're going to go over the review for your Unit 3 test. Remember, as with all of our review videos, you need to have tried the review on your own first, then check your answers, then watch the video to see the things that you are not sure about. So, that being said, let's go ahead and jump in. All right, um, so for the first one, we want to sketch the next figure in our pattern. So the first one, we have a square that's fully shaded. Then we have a square that is half shaded. Then we have a square that is one fourth shaded. So each time the shaded region gets cut in half. So we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that our next figure will be a square because they are all squares. But what we have to look for is where is the shaded region and it is going to be half of the one before it. So if we had something like this, that would be our next figure. It is, po <coughs> excuse me, it is possible that you could have had something more like this. Um, that would have been okay, although this one is more likely to be the next figure. In all honesty, unless we had more examples, we can't be totally sure. Um, but the key is that an eighth of the square is shaded. So the shaded region here is split in half. All right, for number two, we want to write the next two numbers okay make sure you read the directions to see how many numbers you're supposed to write all right so in our pattern we go from zero to one to three to six well we know we're not adding the same thing every time we're not multiplying by the same thing every time we're not subtracting or dividing uh, we know that because the numbers are getting larger so it has to be adding or multiplying uh, or it could be more complex, but we are not doing complex patterns right now. Um, so to get from 0 to 1, we would add 1. To get from 1 to 3, we would add 2. To get from 3 to 6, we would add 3. So our pattern seems to be that we are adding one more than we added last time. So when we go from the second to the third, the first time we added one, so the second time we'll add two. The third time we'll add three. The fourth time we would add four. So six plus four is 10. And then 10 plus five would be 15. So our next two numbers are 10 and 15. And then we would add six, and then we would add seven, and then we would add eight, and so on and so forth. All right, our next section is all about conditional statements, if then statements. And we have this phrase, soccer players are athletes. The first thing we need to do is turn it into an if then statement. Anytime you have the word are or the word is, those imply that those are definitions, you know, because forms of to be mean that is how it exists. It, soccer players exist as athletes. Um, anytime we have that, we know we can rewrite it as an if-then statement. Now, we're starting with soccer players. Soccer players are an example of what? What is the most general term for a being that plays soccer? Well, that would be a person. Okay, so if a person plays soccer or if a person is a soccer player, then what is true? They are an athlete. Okay, so this would be our if part and athlete would be our then part. Soccer player is our hypothesis. Athlete is our conclusion. So which one of these statements says if a person is a soccer player? Okay, and that's going to be 6. So 6 is our if-then statement. That's our basic statement. Now our, um, so that takes care of this one. 
our converse, remember converse switches them around. So not if a person is a soccer player, but if a person is an athlete, we switch soccer player and athlete. So which one of these says, if a person is an athlete, then he or she's a soccer player? That would be this one, number four. So that's B. For inverse, remember we go back to the original statement and negate it. So we originally had if a person is a soccer player. So now we'll have if a person is not a soccer player. And that's going to be five. And then finally, D, we really only have one option. But for contrapositive, we switch them. So we know we need to start with if a person is an athlete. But then we negate it. So if a person is not an athlete. So you definitely need to pay attention to the fact that some of these have the word not in them. And some of them don't. So for the two that have nots, you know that has to be inverse or contrapositive. Those are the only ones that are negated. So in this case, um, even though our questions had our statements and then we matched them with the um, with which part of the if then statement is actually easier if you look at the look at these and then match them up the other way around. So look at if then and see which one it goes towards. Um, so, all right. moving on, our we only have two more problems, uh, and they're both proofs. So, obviously, these are going to take a little bit more time. Um, even though, although this is number seven, you will get graded on each individual piece. So, you could get the majority of the proof right, um, and then maybe just miss one or two pieces of it. You could get it all right, of course. I hope you do. Um, but that also means there's no excuse not to have at least some of the pieces correct. There's also no excuse not to try. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in with this algebraic proof. We're told negative 105 equals 3 minus 3 times the quantity 8m minus 4. That is what we are given. Okay, and again, no excuse not to have those two boxes filled out. Now, if we are solving this equation, what is the first step we're going to do? Now, I've told you before that what I like to do is get rid of parentheses. But you could deal with this positive 3 right there first if you wanted to. It's up to you. Both ways are correct as long as you handle them correctly. But like I said, I am going to deal with the parentheses. So the negative 105 equals and the 3 all drop down. I'm not messing with those right now. Negative 3 times 8m is negative 24m. Negative 3 times negative 4 is positive 12. So that's plus 12. And what did I do just then? Okay, When we spread out that negative 3, we distributed it. So this is the distributive property. Now the next thing we need to do is put the 3 and the 12 together. They are on the same side of the equal sign. And so no signs change. We just put them together. Okay, 3 plus 12 is 15. Now you could have the 15 at the beginning. So 15 minus 24m. You could also have negative 24m plus 15. Does not matter. They are the same thing. So whichever way you want to have it, just remember the 24m is negative, so that minus sign needs to be in front of it either way. And there we combine like terms. The next thing we need to do is move that 15 to the other side so that all of our numbers that have an m are on one side and all of the numbers that don't have an M are on the other. So whether that 15 is at the beginning or the end, it's still a plus 15. So we will subtract to get rid of it. Negative 105 minus 15 is negative 120. And then we still have that negative 24 M and we subtracted. 
So that's subtraction property. Now, as a note, this negative sign right here, it was a minus sign, becomes a negative because now there's not a number in front of it. Don't lose the sign. Okay, Most mistakes in problems like these are when you aren't being careful and you don't bring the negative sign down properly. All right, last thing we need to do is get rid of that negative 24m. So we will divide both sides by negative 24. Negative 120 divided by negative 24 will be positive 5. So uh, 5 equals m. That was the division property. And I just realized up here at the top, this says x equals 5, but it should say m equals 5. Now, our proof statement is m equals 5. Do we have m equals 5 written down here? No, we do not. We have 5 equals m. So our last step, we need to turn that around to get m equals 5. It needs to look exactly like this, of course, without my typo. So anytime we turn something around, that's going to be the symmetric property. And again, there is no excuse not to have this box filled in, this box filled in, and this box filled in. That's not to say you fill those three in and then don't try the rest of it, but you should at the very least have those three correct, whether it's algebra or geometry. All right, our last proof is a geometry proof. Okay, we know that angle PQR is a right angle, and we know, and we're trying to prove that PQS and SQR are complementary angles. So let's go ahead and put our given in. Okay, we're told it's a right angle. What does that mean? What is a right angle? Well, a right angle is an angle whose measure is 90 degrees. So we know the measure of angle PQR is 90 degrees. And the reason we know that is that's what a right angle is. So that's the definition of a right angle. And I'm going to put the box in my picture to remind me that's a right angle when I look at my picture. Now, there's nothing else we can gather from that information. So let's look at our picture. And this is where geometry proofs tend to be harder than algebra proofs. We have to combine the information we're told with the image and see what we can gather from the image. Well, looking at the image, I know that this angle and this angle add up to get this whole angle. Okay, anytime you have two angles next to each other, you can say the small angle plus the small angle equals the whole angle. All right, we went over that in our, our uh, first geometry unit. So we can say that the measure of angle PQS plus the measure of angle SQR equals the measure of angle PQR. And you have to have those M's in front because we're talking about their measures adding together. We can't add pictures. We have to add their measures. Okay, the reason for that, and this is one of those things you need to know because you will use this all semester. This is angle addition property. Okay, we didn't stress these uh, in unit two, the first unit where we covered geometry concepts, we didn't focus on them and stress them for fun. We did it because so many things build on angle addition and segment addition. So moving on, now that we've got two small angles added up to the whole one, we've got angle PQR. Well, we know that angle PQR is 90 degrees. So let's plug that in. So measure of angle PQS plus the measure of angle SQR 
equals 90 degrees. And that's just basic substitution. Okay, remember when you were first learning about variables and stuff, um, you knew you could plug in for a number. That property is called the substitution property. So now we've got two angles that add together to get 90 degrees. Well, what do we call two angles that add together to get 90 degrees? Those are complementary angles. So we know that angle PQS and angle SQR are complementary, and I'm going to abbreviate with just comp, angles. And that's the definition of complementary angles, because that's what complementary angles are. They're angles that add up to 90. So by knowing we had a right angle, we knew that angle was 90 degrees. Knowing we added had two angles that added up to that whole angle, so those two angles added up to 90 degrees, which makes them complementary angles. So again, just like with algebra proofs, no excuse, no excuse, no excuse. But the rest of it, you do need to try. You need to think through it. If this information doesn't get you anything, always go back and look at your picture. Now, on your test, you have one algebra proof and one geometry proof, just like we did on our review. So make sure you look back over these. Study some of the proofs that we did in class. Study some of the ones. I've made two videos where we just went through proofs plus the lesson videos where we went through proofs. So go back over those if you have trouble with these. Uh, if you need some other proofs, Google geometry proofs, maybe basic geometry proofs so you don't get some that are too difficult. Um, but you do need to be aware of how to do these. Okay, Don't be afraid of them. They're not that scary. It's just a different way of thinking. So Make sure you look over all this stuff. Read through your notes again if you have to. Get ready for the test. Good luck. <laughs>